Hello everybody, this is Chris Morosky and this is a short video on the benefits of breastfeeding. The content of this video was taken exclusively from an article written by Allison Stube from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. The title of our article is The Risks of Not Breastfeeding for Mothers and Infants. It was published in Reviews in Obstetrics and Gynecology in 2009. For those who enjoy reading articles and prefer that over video and PowerPoint slides, I do recommend checking out this article. It is very well written, uh, detailed, and has a lot more information than is found in the video. The goals and objectives of this video are to review the national guideline recommendations for postpartum breastfeeding, to correlate the transfer of specific components of breast milk from the mother to the infant with improved health outcomes for the infant, to describe the improved health outcomes seen in mothers who breastfeed their infants, and to understand the importance of physician support of breastfeeding and its impact on women's decisions to choose breastfeeding for their infants. First, moving on to the national guidelines, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists recommends that women exclusively breastfeed their infants six months following delivery. The American Academy of Pediatrics and American Academy of Family Physicians take this one step further. They also recommend six months of exclusive breastfeeding, but they also recommend continued breastfeeding while introducing complementary foods until 12 months or longer following delivery. The question is, how are we doing? And the answer really is that we are falling far short of these guideline recommendations. Only approximately 75% of all infants are ever breastfed once since delivery. Only 31.5% are exclusively breastfed at three months, and only 12% are exclusively breastfed at six months. What we can see is that the variations in breastfeeding rates are closely tied to physician and hospital messaging, practices, and support related to breastfeeding. What are some of the improved health outcomes for infants? We'll review these in the next few slides. There is an increased protection from infectious disease seen with breastfeeding. Plasma cells from the mother's bronchial tree and intestines migrate to the mammary epithelium and produce IgA antibodies specific to the antigens in the mother-infant dyad's immediate surroundings. This is actually pretty cool. This provides specific protection against pathogens in the mother's environment. Also, oligosaccharides in breast milk prevent attachment of common respiratory organisms, including Haemophilus influenza and Streptococcus pneumoniae, to the respiratory epithelium. Glycoproteins in breast milk prevent binding of intestinal pathogens, including Vibrio cholera, E. coli, and rotavirus. Glycosaminoglycans in breast milk prevent binding of HIV, GP120, to the CD4 receptor, thus decreasing transmission of HIV and human milk lipids contribute innate immunity with activity against Giardia lamblia, Haemophilus influenza, Group B streptococcus, Staph epidermidis, respiratory syncytial virus, and herpes simplex virus type 1. Looking at some of the infections and some of the research clinically that um, documents this immunity, first otitis media, Approximately 44% of infants will have one episode of otitis media in their first year of life. The risk of otitis media among formula-fed infants is doubled compared to infants who are exclusively breastfed. Human milk oligosaccharides and antibodies to common respiratory pathogens in the infant's environment are thought to provide protection from infection. Next, lower respiratory tract infection. In a meta-analysis of seven cohort studies of healthy-term infants, Bachrock et al. in 2003 showed that infants who were not breastfed faced a 3.6-fold increased risk of hospitalization for lower respiratory tract infection in the first year of life compared to infants who were exclusively breastfed for more than four months. The majority of respiratory hospitalizations were from RSV. If you've done your pediatric rotation during the wintertime, you're going to see plenty of RSV. Interestingly, lipids in human milk appear to have antiviral activity against RSV. Gastrointestinal infections. In a meta-analysis of 14 cohort studies, Chen and Howey in 2001 showed that infants who were formula-fed or fed a mixture of formula and breast milk were 2.8 times more likely to develop GI infection than those who were exclusively breastfed. In a study of over 17,000 infants, Kramer et al. in 2001 showed that infants in the control group, which had a 6.4% exclusive breastfeeding rate at three months, so it was low, 
these infants were 1.7 times more likely to develop GI illness than those in the intervention group. And the intervention group had a 43.3% exclusive breastfeeding rate at three months. So again, showing the impact of exclusive breastfeeding on decreasing GI illness. In terms of necrotizing enterocolitis, among preterm infants, not being breastfed is associated with a 2.4-fold risk of necrotizing enterocolitis with an absolute risk difference of 5%. The case fatality rate of NEC is 15%, so this absolute risk difference of 5% is clinically significant. And I can tell you with all the neonatologists that I work with nowadays, focusing on mother's milk and breast milk, decreasing necrotizing enterocolitis is very, very important in this premature population. There's also improved immunity um, for babies with um, prolonged and exclusive breastfeeding. Formula-fed infants have a higher pH of their stools and a greater colonization with E. coli, Clostridium difficile, and Bacteroides fragilis. Bioactive factors in human milk appear to facilitate a more favorable gut colonization in breastfed infants. Oligosaccharides, cytokines, and immunoglobulins regulate gut colonization and development of gut-associated lymphoid tissue and govern differentiation of T-cells that play a role in host defense and tolerance. And it's these differences in the immune system differentiation which may underlie the higher incidence of allergic disease in formula-fed children. And looking at asthma, in a meta-analysis by Ip et al. in 2007, Formula-fed children with a family history of asthma or ATP had a 1.7 risk of developing asthma compared with those who were breastfed for three months or more. In another separate study, exclusive breastfeeding for less than three months compared to exclusive breastfeeding for three months or more was associated with a 1.9-fold risk of developing asthma among those with a family history of asthma or ATP. And in terms of atopic dermatitis, infants with a family history of ATP who are exclusively breastfed for less than three months have a 1.7-fold increased risk of atopic dermatitis compared with infants who are exclusively breastfed. And infants who were delivered in hospitals with decreased breastfeeding were 1.9 times as likely to develop atopic dermatitis compared to those who delivered in hospitals with increased breastfeeding rates. Again, prolonged breastfeeding appears to be associated with decreased rates of atopic dermatitis. And finally, looking at obesity and metabolic disease in terms of breastfeeding, in two separate meta-analysis, formula-fed infants were 1.1 to 1.3 times more likely to become obese compared to children who had ever been breastfed. And being formula-fed in infancy is associated with a 1.6-fold risk of type 2 diabetes compared with being breastfed. The proposed mechanisms are that human milk contains adipokines, which may play a role in regulating energy intake and long-term obesity risk. Also, long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids found in breast milk may improve blood pressure and insulin resistance later in life. Certainly, there are also differences in composition of breast milk versus formula, associated lifestyle factors, and self-regulation of intake by the infant, which may play a role in changing metabolic disease associated and around breastfeeding. A quick transition to improved health outcomes for mothers who exclusively breastfeed or breastfeed for longer durations of time. There is a known and decreased risk of certain malignancies for women who breastfeed. Lactation suppresses ovulation and leads to a lactational amenorrhea. Decreased ovulatory cycles are associated with a decreased risk of ovarian cancer. Lactation also causes terminal differentiation of breast tissue, which, following involution, removes these cells from the long-term effects of malignant transformation. In a large longitudinal follow-up study called the Nurses' Health Study 2, it was found that never breastfeeding was associated with a 2.4-fold increase in the incidence of premenopausal breast cancer compared to ever having breastfed. Also, Never breastfeeding was associated with a 1.5-fold increase in the incidence of ovarian cancer compared to women who breastfed for greater than 18 months. There is also a large impact of lactation on maternal metabolism. Breastfeeding poses a 500 kilocalorie per day metabolic burden on mothers. This can contribute to an increased pregnancy weight loss for mothers who breastfeed. 
Breastfeeding also is associated with more favorable glucose levels in the mother, lipid metabolism, and blood pressure. In 1993, Dewey et al. showed that women who breastfed for more than one year lost on average 4.4 pounds more than women who breastfed less than three months, and this difference persisted for two years postpartum. Again, returning to the Nurse Health Study 2, the risk of type 2 diabetes 15 years since birth was 1.7-fold higher among Paris women who never breastfed compared to those who breastfed for a lifetime total of two years or more, and the risk of myocardial infarction 15 years since birth was 1.3-fold higher among Paris women who never breastfed compared to those who breastfed for a lifetime total of two years or more. And just to end on one small point about the role of the physician in promoting breastfeeding. The things that physicians can do to promote breastfeeding include providing education and counseling during prenatal care, avoid participating in formula marketing campaigns and programs. Physicians can also encourage immediate skin-to-skin -skin contact, feeding on demand, and rooming in with the infant following delivery. And finally, in a leadership role, physicians can support a hospital culture that promotes breastfeeding. All of these actions have been shown to greatly increase the likelihood that women will choose breastfeeding for their infants and exclusively breastfeed their infants for longer durations of time, which as we've shown, improves health outcomes for both the moms and their babies. And that brings us to the end of the video. As you can see, we did review the national guideline recommendations for postpartum breastfeeding. We also correlated the transfer of specific components of breast milk from the mother to the infant with improved health outcomes for the infant. We described the improved health outcomes seen in mothers who breastfeed their infants, and there was an understanding of the importance of physician support of breastfeeding and its impact on women's decisions to choose breastfeeding for their infants. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. Hope you found it educational. Good luck with your studies, and we'll see you soon in class.